You're listening to the Joy of Champagne podcast, your guide to the world of sparkling wines. And now your host, Dennis Byram. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Joy of Champagne. I'm your host, Dennis Byram. On this episode, I will try to tell you the real story of champagne and tackle the stories we're oftentimes told about champagne, which most of us take at face value. So forget about what you've been told and get ready to uncover the actual and not-so-romantic truths behind champagne and its history. Why is champagne as a single region such a cult exclusively for sparkling wines? And how long exactly have sparkling wine acted as the major wine of the region? Throughout this episode, whenever I use the name champagne, it will only refer to the region and not the wine. This is because champagne isn't only the name of the wine, it's the name of a region. So to begin with, champagne is indeed a region in northeast France, and it's located two hours drive east of Paris to be exact. The word champagne comes from the Latin word campagna, which is the name of the famous region in southern Italy as well where Naples is located. Campania, or Champagne, means flat, open land in Latin. And when Romans came to France, they gave the same name to this area of France as well. Just like other regions in France, Champagne was a region that always made wine, but these were just like any other region, were still wines, including dry red wines. So the wine of Champagne wasn't always sparkling after all, Hate to burst your bubble, but champagne wasn't even invented in champagne. As a matter of fact, what if I told you that bubbles were considered to be a fault in wines of champagne before the 18th century? Sparkling champagne is very far from being the first sparkling wine ever to grace this earth. Sparkling wines were made way before sparkling champagne came into existence, especially in the Limoux region and south of France. These were primitive sparkling wines made in the ancestral method, which means that the wines were oftentimes cloudy and with the dead yeast sediment still inside. Quite primitive and indeed ancestral. But the real difference here is the nature of how the bubbles were created in these wines. Were they created accidentally or intentionally? In Limu, the people who made the wine there knew that If a wine was to be bottled too early, meaning before the end of fermentation, the wine would become sparkling inside the bottle, and for that reason some bottles would burst because of the excess pressure that's built. Since back in the day, there weren't any refrigeration or air conditioning. In autumn time, following harvest, fermentation of the wines would start to slow down before they had the chance to completely finish. As the cold winter months started creeping in, thereupon slowing the fermentation speed, before eventually completely stopping it during peak winter months. This is for the same reason why we use fridges to slow down the spoilage of of foods. Yeast and bacteria work much slowly in colder temperature. In this case, this slows the winemaking process. But once springtime arrived and the temperature started rising, the yeast would wake back up from dormancy and fermentation would restart with whatever sugar that's left in the wine. But if the wine was bottled between winter and spring, before the weather warmed up, then you would essentially get sparkling wine when the spring or summertime arrived. Of course, it wouldn't be all fun and games since some of the bottles, if not most, wouldn't be able to stand the pressure of the second fermentation inside the bottle, and they would eventually burst. This method was started to be used intentionally in Lumu. But make no mistake, this is the primitive method, not the complex and the superior champagne method. In fact, Cremant de Limoux is the descendant of these ancestral wines from south of France. But how did champagne method came to be then? Now I can imagine some of you thinking and saying, but isn't Dom Perignon supposed to be the inventor of sparkling champagne? And I think you can imagine my answer to that. It is just a false myth. So let's talk about who Dom Perignon is for the first time. Dom Perignon was the winemaker in the Benedictine Abbey of Saint-Pierre d'Orvillet, which is located in the region of Champagne, of course. Dom Perignon's abbey was famed for their superb still red wines, and it, it was so renowned in France at the time that it 
was even endorsed by the French king. He was very significant in the history of Champagne because he was integral in ensuring and promoting quality winemaking methods with his precise and clean methods, but not in making sparkling Champagne. In fact, there isn't even a single shred of evidence that Dom Perignon made even a single bottle of sparkling wine. And one of the most grave inaccuracies in the supposed Dom Perignon is the inventor of Champagne story, that one day he discovered some of his bottles of wines were bursting from the excess pressure of the accidental second fermentation. And upon this he shouted, Come quickly, I am drinking the stars. But this isn't actually possible, since all wine was made and sold in barrels at the time, as glass and especially molded glass bottles were incredibly expensive let alone the technology to make proper glass bottles weren't even advanced enough back then, especially in France. Even in import markets like England, wines were always sold from barrels until the end buyer filled their home-brought bottle in the wine shop. So pressurized bubbly bottles of wine were impossible to see for Dom Perignon. And very likely that until he died, he intentionally avoided effervescence in his wines, as opposed to promoting it to make sparkling champagne, as we know today. During the time he lived, bubbles were so unwanted and unwelcome in wines that the nickname the French had for these accidentally bubbly wines was Vin du Diable, which means devil's wine. So it's obvious that this romantic addition to the story about Don Perignon is clearly made up. Except he was indeed a famed winemaker in Champagne, although not for sparkling wine, but for great red wine. So who discovered the method of making champagne then? What if I told you that regardless of the ancestral method, champagne method wasn't even invented in champagne, let alone in France or even by anyone French? I know, it's a shock for many people, but it is a fact. The champagne method was actually first invented, or rather put into words, by an Englishman, right in the heartland of England. This Englishman's name was Christopher Merritt. He was a physician from Gloucestershire, and he first of all described the method, which later became to be known as the champagne method. He published his findings on this method on 1662, which is 30 years even before the technique was first started to be used in Champagne. Regardless of Christopher Merritt's discovery, during the 17th century, the English, the particularly the well-off, were already adding sugar to almost anything that they ate and drank, since sugarcane was the hottest new discovery from the West Indies in the New World. And it's commonly known that the English also sweetened their wine quite a lot to make them more palatable. Because let's be honest, who doesn't like sweetness? Especially when you just discovered sugarcane for the first time. That's how the English planted the first seeds of the champagne method, by adding extra sugar to their own bottles of wine, which many times made their wine sparkle with a second fermentation. It was the English who managed to discover this, but not the French, also because of the stronger glass that they used as opposed to the weaker glass that was used in France. This is because the English could make stronger glass at the time with very hot coal fire, whereas in France the glass was made with not as hot wood fire, as France didn't yet have ample access to coal at the time. So contrary to popular belief, it was the English consumer who created the method of champagne by shaping their own style, which eventually led the French to actually make their wine sparkle. So from the perspective of the French, the method wasn't embraced voluntarily, but it was rather dictated by the market. So wine of champagne became sparkling not because the Champenois loved the technique or even the wines, but because of economic desperation at the time and the fact that the British elites were head over heels with their bubbly wines. In fact, they were getting still wines from Europe and were making them sparkle by adding sugar and molasses themselves. So the champagne method first became the preferred method of making wine, and eventually the only way of making wine in the region today. 
This is not because the people of Champagne wanted it, but because of the market pressure and the higher price that sparkling wines fetched in the British market. In 1800, Champagne production was about 300,000 bottles, and by 1850, it rose to a staggering 20 million bottles. That's great evidence of how fast the popularity of Champagne rose. For example, the famed Champagne house, Veuve Clicquot, was a textile business initially, and had nothing to do with winemaking until the Champagne method was embraced and popularized. So Champagne, as we know today, was truly created by an industrial market approach. And then the story behind it was romanticized to market the wine itself, which as we've seen today, isn't all that romantic as the French may claim. But the tactic sure was one of the biggest marketing successes of the 19th and the 20th century. So much so that it led the whole world to call all sparkling wines after itself. So here's to Christopher Merritt and to the English drinkers who sweetened up their wines to make them sparkle. To Dom Perignon for his revolutionary advancements in winemaking and for his superb red wine. And to the French for making Champagne a world star with one of the most clever and the best marketing campaigns in history. Thank you all for creating the delicious goodness we all call Champagne and we all enjoy so much today. Hope you've enjoyed listening to the real story of Champagne. And if you have any questions or any subjects you're curious about that you'd like us to talk about, please let us know by sending us an email on hello at joyofchampagne.com. And we'll try to address them and uncover more mysteries and myths altogether. Until next time, stay bubbly. Before we end, a word from our sponsors. This episode of the Joy of Champagne podcast was brought to you by The Excelsior by Dukes, one of the world's finest champagne flutes. 10.7 inches tall with a 10 ounce capacity. Handcrafted and mouth blown, lead free crystal glass. Find out more at clubdukes.co. That's spelled C L U B D U X dot C O. Because there are some things man can make better than any machine. Thanks for listening to the Joy of Champagne podcast, your guide to the world of sparkling wines. We hope you join us on the next episode. In the meantime, feel free to visit us at joyofchampagne.com or drop us an email at hello at joyofchampagne.com.